Welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and already being so chatty in the chat. It's really lovely when we hear from you and when you type your thoughts in the chat. So please keep that going. My name's Jess. I've met a few of you. I've got a few names I'm recognizing there in the chat coming up. So uh, if you haven't met me though, I'm Jess from Design School and I'm coming to you today from Canvas Space, which is our newest venue here in Sydney. And we're super excited to be launching this series of webinars for all of our Canva users and particularly our not-for-profit friends today. So today we have Ben with us, who is a super experienced community manager here at Canva to take us through the Social Cause Marketing Bootcamp. Ben has a decade of experience in the social innovation sector, a postgrad qualification, qualification in community development, and a track record for building movements that make a difference. He happens to be addicted to helping social causes and businesses discover the path to scale. So we're super excited to have you here today, Ben. Over to you. Great. Uh, thanks for having me and welcome everybody here um, and to our first ever marketing boot camp just for not-for-profits. Before I really jump in, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. So as you may have noticed, this session is being uh, recorded. So take all the notes you want, but uh, you can rewatch it later. I believe we'll be posting it on YouTube in a few days uh, or a little later, but we'll get yeah. it up there. Um, we'll receive we should... an email with the, with the link to the recording as well. Great, amazing. Um, uh, so the other thing is we'll have a Q&A at the end, but I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on chat as well, just to see, you know, if there's anything that I'm kind of missing or I need to go back over or things like that. So please do fire away in chat with questions and things like that. And chat, that's what I'm going to call you. <laughs> Could you please uh, test it out now by um, just, I don't know, showing me one thing you want to learn out of this boot camp. Just type in a simple question, fire away. And I might read a few of them out, but what do you want to know? What's the thing you're struggling with? What's what's the most uh, important thing in terms of marketing from you? Oh, Thurston County feedback in Olympia. Look at this. Yeah. Everyone's typing. I can see a million <laughs> people typing. Adding more fluff to my designs. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to say less fluff is better almost always, but but sure. Uh, impact stories, very important. How much is too much? Um, we want to have engagement, not, but not flood. That's really interesting. And I think workshop two might help you a little bit with that. Uh, marketing strategies. Oh, uh, yep. That's, there's going to be a lot of strategies. Uh, a compelling marketing plan. Okay. That kind of helps narrow down the, the strategy side of things. Um, better stories through fleet and Twitter. Um, time back through clever use. Yes. I really hope that what we put together in the next three workshops will help you get some time back. Um, ah, for, for, to create a cache of thumbnails and post to attract audiences and tell a story and a mission. Okay, that's clever. So a bit of a stockpile of media, really good. Um, and another person who's keen on time back through clever use. All right, I think, I think we're gonna be covering a lot of that in the next three days in our little half hour sessions and in some of the homework. So um, let's get started. But just before we begin, I have to do something really important. Um, a lot of you are not from Australia, but uh, I am, and I am currently presenting from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora nation. And it's really important to me to pay my respects to them their elders, their past elders, and the young people who are going to grow up and, and help, you know, champion the Eora people in the future as well. So I'm Ben, I'm from Canva. Canva, I can't even say the organization name. <laughs> uh, thankfully, Jess did that for me. And I'm the head of community at a tiny little site that Canva owns called Pixabay. So, and I spend most of my days launching and testing social media campaigns and doing a lot of other community management stuff too. Um, but the reason I'm here today probably relates more to my first career. And in my first career, I worked for not-for-profits and social causes, just like a lot of you. Uh, I was a mental health advocate at an organization called Atticas. I worked for a digital health agency called reachout.com. And I also helped people like you crowdfund, uh, to fundraise, to raise money for your causes. And uh, that was at a place called Shuft. And I got up to about a million dollars a month in funds raised for people there. So that's where I came from. And this is why I really care 
about you all and what you're doing because it still really, really matters to me. And that's why I joined Canva because Canva also really gives a stuff about you and the social causes and the differences you're trying to make. They have this motto, which is designed for everyone. And one of their core focuses there is really to help those people in the world who need to tell a story and get others to help make some kind of difference. And so because of that, uh, they've got this cool tool, which you might've poked around in, um, which lets you make pretty much anything and share it pretty much anywhere including on social media, which is, you know, handy for this little session. And it's completely free. So later I'm going to share a little workbook with you with a bit of homework, sorry, um, and a couple of activities, but I'll also share a link to where you can go to apply for the free not-for-profit pro Canva thing so that hopefully you never have to pay for it. If you are, then let's try and get it for free for you. So this is what we're going to cover in the boot camp in our next three days worth of little half hour sessions. So, whoop. yes, so today we're going to think about the person. We're going to think about who we need to reach out to and why and what we need to tell them in order to convince them to support us. Tomorrow, we're going to think a bit more about the journey that the person is on. Are they right at the start of their journey, i.e. they know nothing about what you're doing, or are they a long way in the journey and they're rabid supporters and they're already out there, uh, like, uh, I don't know, yelling about your cause, raising money, telling other people, pulling people in. And then on Friday, we're going to kind of stick together uh, today and tomorrow's sessions into a bit of a plan, a bit of a toolkit that helps you actually use the concepts I'm going to share with you to get a campaign going and hopefully keep it running without too much effort and without too much hard work. And well, there'll still be a little bit of hard work, but when you do that hard work, it should hopefully always be helping you get more people, get more engagement, get more revenue, whatever it is you need. So let's drill into today and understanding our person. And I'm going to call them our first follower. It's a very special particular type of person. Um, so you might be asking or wondering what the hell is a first follower? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, maybe you asked. I don't really know. I wish I could tell. Um, that's what I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain why we need a first follower and what, what they are. We're going to think about why they will give. And when I talk about giving, I mean perhaps donating, but it may also be volunteering. It may be purchasing something if you're running a business or you have a social enterprise or you sell something that helps make a difference. Um, it could be any type of giving. And then we're going to do an activity that helps capture those things and a few other things in a way that allows you to kind of, I guess, keep a record and also share what you've learned today with other people so that they can get on track and hopefully do things, do more with less, do more marketing with less, have more impact with less. So... First, we're going to talk about the first follower and why they're so important. But to do that, I actually need to take one more step back and explain why social marketing is kind of like a wedding dance. And I say dance and some people say dance. So I'm sorry in advance for that. Jess will be like, ugh, dance, not dance. <laughs> um, so who has been to a wedding? Chat, please tell me someone here has been to a wedding. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Great. One person, a few. Oh, and, and Kit's currently at a wedding. Great. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, duh. Fair enough. Yeah, duh. Definitely. Three. Great. Uh, I've been to many, uh, but I, I went to one myself a little while ago um, uh, as, as the groom and I got married and it was very exciting. And at the reception, we had what is a pretty common tradition in many weddings around the world, which is a wedding dance at the reception after the wedding. And as you may know, they play some beautiful romantic music, you and your lovely bride come up and, and dance and everybody watches. And there's this weird bit where you've been dancing for a little while, maybe half a song, something like that. And there's this expectation, this unspoken expectation that people start joining in. People start moving from watching to participating. And there's always hesitation there, uh, especially Indian dance. Yes, it is famous. I'd love to get to a wedding um, from, oh, that would be a cool experience to have. Unfortunately, I haven't been that lucky yet. So back to the example, there is this gap and there's this fear of joining. And what happens, at least at my wedding, was a, uh, 
a drunk uncle got up. He was loved the music and he couldn't sit still any longer and he jumped onto the floor and he started dancing. And that created this little sort of tidal effect where more and more people got, came up because the first person had done the silly, unknown, scary thing. And now it was becoming more and more normal to join in. And so eventually the dance floor filled up and the wedding reception area emptied. And suddenly it was actually weird to be sitting back and not joining in rather than participating in the dance. So you can see this little flow. You can see this movement of people. And that happens in marketing. That happens in all sorts of businesses. It happens in tech companies. People write whole PhDs and books about this. Uh, there's a particularly good one called Crossing the Chasm, if you ever want to read it. And I can probably link to that in one of our workbooks, if I remember. But here's a slide that kind of illustrates it. And I would like to thank Prashan Paramanathan from Chuft, who uh, lent me this slide. But it kind of shows the effect. So right now, it might be you. Uh, and a few first followers or a few people, or you might have like huge traction already. Um, but for most people, we're still at this stage of our cause and we have a few people who are supporting us, but it's still a little weird. It's still a little uncertain for new people. Um, they're still not sure if they want to jump in and if they want to join in and if they want to be a part of this because they're not sure if other people are doing it. But if we can invest time in finding those first followers, those drunk uncles, who don't care, they really love what you're doing already, they're really enthusiastic. And if we can get them in and we can get them involved, and if we can get maybe a thousand of them, then the next million will be a whole lot easier to get. So that's our first follower. And that's what we're going to talk about reaching out to today. So how do you find your first follower? Well, to answer that question, we have to answer another question, which is what is empathy? Because that's where it all starts. So chat, what is empathy? It's a pretty easy question. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? You don't need a dictionary definition. Any ideas? Everyone's typing. <laughs> understanding the feelings of others. Spot on. Very much. Understanding, understanding how people think, um, feeling connected, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, someone else's, sorry, I, you wrote that perfectly and then I read it terribly. Um, the ability to feel, yeah, absolutely. So that is exactly what empathy is. And the, the downfall of, okay, <laughs> that was an interesting one. I, you'll have to explain what that means at some stage, Claire. Uh, uh, so great answers. Empathy actually has a neurological basis. There's things in our brain called mirror neurons, circuitry that help us understand other people. They help us understand their emotions, their feelings. And if we really work at it, we can even kind of guess what they're thinking a lot of the time. Um, so what happens is there's this magic little network of neurons and um, scientists have shown that when we talk to a person or see a person doing something, if we see them upset or happy or something like that, um, the feelings they're feeling, they get simulated in our brain. And that's kind of cool. And it's really powerful, but I know because of my mirror neurons, neurons that you're thinking, why does this matter for marketing? So hopefully I can kind of answer that. Um, and the reason why is because we need to take advantage of these mirror neurons to get a little bit of an edge. Um, we need to get inside the heads of our followers a little bit. Um, a lot of marketers stop at demographics, which is, you know, where does a person live? Uh, how much do they earn? What social media platforms are they on? Very important, but not the only thing to consider. Um, and they forget to think about what sort of things they can say uh, in order to convince the person to do the thing that they want them to do, to buy that vacuum cleaner, to support that cause, to volunteer, to donate, to do whatever it is. And so that sort of stuff is sometimes called psychographics, thinking about what people think, thinking about what people believe, and thinking about what motivates people. And there's this whole field of this. And if people are really keen, I can share some articles and some books on psychographics. But for today, because we're focusing on keeping it simple, and making the most with the littlest amount of effort, we're just going to talk about two concepts that kind of relate to psychographics. And the first one is, is your cause a vitamin 
or a painkiller? In other words, what needs do you meet for your first follower? And are they crucial or are they just kind of, you know, a nice thing to have? And then the second thing is, what is your first follower's reason for giving? Why are they motivated to actually give? And that's important because otherwise, why are we doing this? Why we won't get them over the line? So let's talk about vitamins and painkillers. Uh, why do you take a painkiller chat? Why do you take one? And why do you take a vitamin? What do you take a vitamin for? Get rid of pain, to relieve pain. You want the pain to go away, yeah. So it's generally, a, a painkiller is generally pretty important. It's the sort of thing where you're like, I really need that and I'm gonna be very unhappy until I've got that. Whereas a vitamin, Corey, great answer, uh, to get stronger, to boost your immunity, it's kind of preventative. Um, so a painkiller, absolutely, for people living with pain, chronic pain, a painkiller can be the thing that allows them to function. So it can be so important. Um, so one thing, uh, one thing is crucial and the other thing is very nice to have. And we need both. But all causes, all businesses, all tech companies, um, everything we do in the world is probably a vitamin or a painkiller. It either fixes a fundamental problem and meets a need uh, or it prevents or helps you grow or is a nice thing to have. So when you talk to your first follower, which hopefully you will do in the next 24 hours before our next bootcamp, um, you might be able to figure out if your cause is a vitamin or a painkiller to them. So don't think about it from your perspective, think about it from your first follower's perspective and how they perceive your cause. So some people might be like, I, if it's a vitamin, I wanna help make a difference. Um, my friends were doing this cool fundraising activity. I thought I'd join in because it was fun for me too. You know, I feel good. Um, whereas a painkiller, a lot of the time, painkiller causes uh, or followers who support because it's a painkiller have a lived experience of the issue. Perhaps they lost a loved one, they've experienced the illness, um, they've escaped something really tough. And so for them, it's kind of a mission and it's really important to see that impact. Both are valid. You may have first followers of both types. So that's the vitamin or painkiller concept. The next thing we need to think about is reasons for giving, because that's going to take us from, you know, just what your cause is to that person into what we need to do or what kind of things we should offer to motivate them to actually support. Because there's a lot of causes out there that I'm sure you're aware of, um, that your current donors are aware of, that your first followers are aware of, that they don't support. And what we need to do is we need to figure out how to get them over the line how to get them from just being aware to really excited and going, I have to do something. And so we can look at the reasons why a lot of people give. And we can also look at a lot of campaigns that tie into these reasons why people give. And there's five reasons, which four are on this slide, which I'll quickly explain. And then there's a fifth big one that actually underpins everything. Well, for a lot of first followers anyway. So the first reason to give is glory. And a first follower who gives for glory is thinking something along the lines of other people are going to see me giving and I think I'm cool or awesome or a good company or a good person. Then there's glow. So that's kind of like glory, but it's an internal thing. It just feels good. It's such a rush to know I helped save that cute animal um, or that, um, you know, that hum hungry or homeless vulnerable person has a place to stay, stay tonight and that I helped and I had that, I contributed to that. Then there's guilt. So do you feel bad when you see particular fundraising campaigns? I'm sure all of you can think of one where you saw it and you were like, oh, that's such a sad story. Um, do you feel like if you don't help that you're sort of complicit in this person or animal suffering? That's often a guilt reason for giving. Um, and then finally, there's grow. So, well, not finally, because there's one more on the next slide. Um, and this is all about... Uh, giving or contributing or volunteering because you want to develop yourself. So you don't want to just feel good. You want to kind of grow in some way. And a lot of the time um, people will volunteer um, and, and grow will be one of their reasons for giving. They want to skill up. They want some experience. They want to develop more social skills. 
Um, they want to learn about rescuing animals or whatever it is that your cause is doing. Finally, there's greed. Because not all giving is purely altruistic. If you talk to some psychologists out there, they would say there's no such thing as true altruism. Uh, and I'm going to explain altruism. Altruism just means um, doing the right thing for no particular reason other than doing the right thing. Um, so sometimes we might want something in return for our giving. A lot of the time in crowdfunding campaigns, for example, the cause will offer a perk in return for giving. Um, so for example, uh, one of my favorites, um, I will explain guilt in a, in a second, Ankit, and I can answer some questions too, but I do have about 10 minutes, so I need to keep moving. <laughs> but uh, I think this will, this will help you in a second. So one of my favorite examples of a, of a greed gift, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Maybe you can think of a better term than greed, um, but it was a snout autograph from a pig and an animal sanctuary. So if you are kind enough to support this sanctuary by giving more than $100, um, then this wonderful pig had learned how to smoosh its face on a piece of paper. And you got sent that piece of paper with the funny snout print in the middle in a framed uh, frame so that you can remember the thing you gave. And interestingly, even though many people gave $100, many more people gave $100 for that little snout portrait rather than just giving it. So they wanted something in return. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's okay. And it didn't cost the cause much. In fact, we're I'm told the pig enjoyed it. So, all right, activity time. So let's think about some giving roles, looking at example campaign copy um, or uh, campaign tactics. So let's look at this one. This is a giant check that's publicly shared with the world um, from a large business, a large tech company. What is the giving role here. Is it greed? Is it guilt? Is it glow? Is it glory? Yes, glory. Spot on. It's glory. Yeah, glows. Glory. Yep, spot on. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a public gift. There's no reason you need a check that big to donate $50,000. Pretty sure the little ones work just fine, even if they have a lot of money in them. And yeah, actually, Corey, that's a really good point. It's wonderful that Microsoft gave this gift and they gave it to a really good cause. Um, and it's important for them to be seen to be doing good. So it's okay to have that glory. And to be, to be honest, I'm like good on them. Um, but that's probably one of their motivators is to be seen to be doing well rather than just you know secretly doing it in the corner or something like that. This next one has a bit of a trigger warning. Um, there's some domestic violence themes and, and things like that. So I'm gonna give you five seconds to just, yeah, you already know what it is. Um, so just if, if you are triggered, just just, Turn away for 30 seconds or block your ears. I'll show you this campaign and then we'll move on and we'll be back to non-triggering stuff. Okay, three, two, one. All right, so this is pretty tough. Why is it so hard to see black and blue? One in six women are victims of abuse. That's no illusion. So why, what, what is this? Is this glory? Why would you give? What, would mo what are they trying, what motivation are they trying to tie into? Is it glory? Is it guilt? Guilt, spot on. Now, there's a lot of guilt campaigns out there. Uh, I think it's overdone. And to be honest, I don't like the way it portrays people um, in, in, this, in this sort of setting. This person is a survivor, not a victim. Um, they have a whole life and this is one rough experience. Do we really want to sort of shape everything around that experience? I don't know. But for some people, guilt is, guilt is a campaign and that's that. All right, what about this one? Grow a mo, save a bro. Is it grow? It's a mustache. Or is it guilt? It's glory. Yeah, I think glory is probably the, the, the right one. It could also actually be grow. You know what's really, <laughs> what's really um, interesting about this is like, I actually just wanted to know if I could grow a mustache the first time I participated in this. Um, and yeah, I wanted to raise funds and make a difference, but I was already in the mental health field. So I was like, I'm kind of doing that. But I was like, this is an excuse to grow a mustache, so I'm going to do it. Uh, so it was actually grow for me uh, because I wanted to find something out about myself. Um, there's probably deeper reasons that people do grow, but you might want to think of those secondaries and things like that. Yeah, so glory probably, maybe grow for some people. Never participated in it again because I can't grow a mustache, but I still donate it. All right, what about this one? A photo of a child happily holding a photo of 
their donor, the person who supports them and looks after them. Great excuse to grow a mustache, yes. Okay, anyway, moving on. Um, so why, why would a person support this cause? What's their reason for giving? What's the feeling? Greed, maybe, maybe it could be. Glow, glow I think fits better, but it could be greed for some people too. Glow and glory, yeah. I would say that this is probably, you know what, this is interesting. I'm getting a lot of different answers here. Uh, that's kind of cool because I think maybe in your causes, you may see that first followers have different reasons for giving too. I think the primary reason here is probably glow because typically you don't see, the donor's not shown off to anyone else. It's just you and the kid who know. Uh, it makes you feel good. Um, it might be guilt, but this kid's having a good life in a, in a good school. And, you know, I think it's more about the positive positivity and knowing you're participating in that. So I would say it's probably glow, but I do agree. It could be a few other things. All right. Thank you for playing the guess the giving role game. I want you to think a little bit about that for your cause, but particularly, hopefully when you talk to your first followers a little bit later, what it is for them, which one of those giving roles or reasons ties in. Anyway, back to the Prezzo. So we've talked about vitamins or painkillers. We've talked about reasons for giving. Um, and we haven't talked about demographics. And that's because... I think you all can figure out the demographics thing on your own. Um, and in the activity I'm about to share with you, I'll explain how to do that a little bit more. But the main thing that you want to think about with demographics, and the only reason I mention it here is there's one part of demographics that's really important, which is where the hell are they on the internet? Or how do you reach them? Are they on TikTok? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? Or are they on Twitter? Uh, if you want to think about that and put that in the chat while I move on to the next slide. I'd, I'd love you to share. I know a lot of the followers for the causes that I worked with were on Facebook, but increasingly they're shifting across to Instagram and TikTok because they're finding more reach and they don't have to pay for it. Facebook, Insta, Insta LinkedIn, Twitter. Nice. Good little spread there. So that's kind of cool. All right. So we've covered the person. Oh, Facebook heavy and shifting to Insta and Twitter. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people who are Facebook heavy and the algorithm's just not doing what the algorithm used to do for them. So yeah, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, let's put it all together and let's put it all together with an example. And once you've done that example, we will, and I'm sorry, I'm very low on time, so I'll be really quick. Um, once you've done that example, hopefully, um, you can go off and do it for yours. So we're going to use an example here, which is Slum Art Nigeria. And uh, this is a great cause in Nigeria that supports children and young people who live in slums. Uh, they fund schools, they fund uh, development of children and health interventions and things like that. And they do that by um, getting children to create and sell art in, in the community and, in, and to the world. Pretty cool cause. And this is Tammy. And she's a fundraising photographer who wants to support slum art. She only earns about $50,000 a year, which in Sydney is just enough to pay rent. So she doesn't really actually have much disposable income to donate, but that's okay because for her, it's kind of about the glory. It feels good to publicly fundraise for her cause. Um, it, it feels good to show um, others how her creative superpowers can help make a difference in the world. Um, and it's the cause is kind of a vitamin because she's never been to Nigeria. Uh, she doesn't have lived experience of this, but she knows that she can make a difference and she wants to know that she's doing that. So it's like fulfilling a need, but it might not be a painkiller need. It's probably a vitamin need. And then we've kind of got the buyer's journey, channels, sources of information and frustrations. So, uh, and objections. So objections and frustrations are kind of self-explanatory. Why? would they say no? And this is a common question. How do I know my money actually will be used to make a difference? And what might be frustrating? If they're crowdfunding for you, what happens if no one donates? That's going to suck. They're not going to like that. It's not going to tie into their glory. Um, buyer's journey uh, is just where they're at. Do they not know you exist yet? Or are they right on the deep end and happy to go out and tell others about you? And in this case, she's, she's an advocate. So she's kind of in the deep end. She's ready to tell others. Uh, and her channel's Pretty straightforward. TikTok, WhatsApp, not Facebook this time. Um, and she goes to Medium for information, not Facebook or Instagram. And she has an influencer, Savannah LeBrant, that look, anyone, anything that Savannah talks about is something that she's going to be behind. 
Right. So that was an example persona. It was a bit of a, a snapshot of this person. And hopefully it pulls in all that stuff about vitamins and painkillers and puts it in a format that's actually useful. So I'd like you to do that. This is your homework for tonight or tomorrow, depending on what time it is for you, or this morning for the 4.30 a.m. person. Thank you for waking up that early. Um, we're going to do a 10-minute persona activity. So in the workbook that I think uh, Jess will share and that we'll probably email out as well, you'll have a little persona template like this, which will hopefully end up looking a little bit like this, like Tammy's persona template, but it doesn't have to be um, as comprehensive or as detailed. I just want you to do something. 10 minutes is all you really need. If you want to spend a little longer, you'll get a bit more out of it. And how you're going to complete or find this information with the persona, well, it's going to involve these three steps. I'd like you to actually go and talk to someone who supports your cause, if you can. All right? Actually talk to someone, just five or 10 minutes. You're going to ask them some questions. You don't have to ask all the questions. You might know some of the answers without asking them, like the demographic ones. They're pretty easy to guess a lot of the time. Um, and you're going to write it down. You're going to put it in on the, on the persona. So here are some questions that you can use to help fill out the persona. Um, or you could go, hey, can you help me fill this out and, and get them to fill it out with you? That doesn't really matter. We're just, we're just getting started. Um, but here's some questions. Here's some psych psychographic questions. Why do you support us? Why don't you support us? Um, who do you follow? Or, and when I say follow, it's like, you know, like, who do you really follow? Who do you like go and check? Um, how old are you? Demographics questions, things like that. Right. So all of that is in the workbook. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, and I really hope you do, is to fill out that little persona and to share it with me as quickly as you can. Because I'd really like to review some of these personas before our next workshop so that I can actually really understand a little bit of your too late in Montreal tomorrow. In the next, uh, in the next 18 hours is fine. So <laughs> if you wake up and do it in the morning, that's, that's fine too. Um, if you can't get someone on the phone or have a coffee with someone, that's fine. How, do your best guess because we've just got to start somewhere and that's the important thing. So have a go. And then before our little boot camp tomorrow, please do share it with me. There's some instructions on how to share it and a little Google form in there. Um, and there's also a spot for you to ask bigger questions. Finally, I'll be on in the Canva uh, not-for-profits community, um, hopefully for a little bit this afternoon uh, and this evening or morning, depending on where you are, uh, just to check in and answer questions there. For those of you who can, Jess, I hope this is okay. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, for those of you who do submit a persona and are willing to let me review it in a de-identified way tomorrow so that others can learn, um, I have organized a $100 Canva print voucher so that hopefully you can actually print some stuff and get it out there because that's often more powerful than social sometimes. All right, that's a wrap, but um, there's instructions on how to submit your entry and all of that stuff in, in the little worksheet. Uh, I think the presentation deck will be shared. Um, and if there is, there's a little link there, otherwise, good luck. <laughs> yes, the motive is to get, um, you know, t-shirt printing money basically. Uh, can you suggest some books on psychographics before you go? Uh, let me post that in the community in the workbook. Um, I could probably dig up a few links. There's also just great articles and people who talk on this as well, which is sometimes less, like more straightforward. Um, you're already asking questions, but this is a spot for the questions as well. But just before I dive into that, um, you're kind of my first followers. So what I'd like to know is, am I on the right track? Am I giving you the right information. And if I am, please tell one other person about the next workshop and get them to come along. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I need to revise this presser. It's all part of the learning curve, right? So thank you and questions. I know I'm a little bit over time. I waffled too much, but I'm here for a little longer if you can stick around and you wanna ask anything. Fantastic. Like, click, share and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple of questions. We have a question from oh. Corey who says, what do you think are the three things nonprofits do wrong with social media? Oh, yeah, okay. So um, they don't do enough preparation a lot of the time. 
um, because they're like, I've got to get this campaign out and I've just got to get it done because my my job is making a difference. Um, there's very few small to medium not-for-profits that have, you know, a giant marketing budget and a full-time marketer. So because of that, they don't invest time in understanding who the hell they're talking to and they just kind of whip up something and they get it out and they don't think about what is it going to do? How is it going to get people across the line? Um, what, what do I actually need out of this? Do I even need a marketing campaign? So that's the first thing is probably not enough preparation. Um, yeah. The next thing is they do is they, they go from no planning to hiring a consultant and a marketing agency and a graphic designer and doing this really long and complicated marketing process that is then set in stone forever. So they go from like no planning and throwing something out there to too deep in, in the other direction and they get locked in stone. So they're not lean or agile enough, which I'll, waffle on about in a couple of days. Um, so there, that's probably thing two. Um, hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff in there. I'm trying to think of like the third thing that they do. And maybe that's like spreading too far or hitting too many chat. Oh, no, I've got the best thing. They don't use emails. That's, that's the third mistake. Um, because once you've got someone, um, emailing them about what you're doing every now and then in a non-spammy way is actually really, really powerful. And if you've got all these people on social who are coming in and subscribing and donating and things like that, then you probably don't need to invest time in hitting them again on social. It's more efficient to just go connect with them via email once you've kind of made them your first followers, made them your biggest fans. All right, another question? Fantastic. Yes, we have a question from Jean. <laughs> Would the approach for nonprofits have similar be similar to social enterprises, except for the profit. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I consider, I see less and less difference between a social enterprise and a not-for-profit, um, uh, because you know you have a triple bottom line, but uh, you know you have to be profitable, sustainable, and do good. Um, but a not-for-profit still has to be profitable to some degree too. You know, you're going to have overheads, you're going to have costs and things like that. So if you are a social enterprise and therefore you are making some kind of difference or positive good in the world, then you can still connect with people and engage their reasons to give um, in the same way or a very similar way to the way a not-for-profit does. Um, you may be able to tap into the greed motivator and greed is definitely a deliberately inflammatory term, um, but uh, as a social enterprise, you can sort of say, well, here's this nice thing for you and you're making a difference. Um, you know, a great example in Australia is Too Good, um, who uh, if you buy lunch or you buy some hand soap or whatever from them, they give exactly the same thing to a vulnerable person in, in an Australian community, someone in a refuge typically. So yeah, pretty, much, pretty similar, but you do have to dial it in because your cause is different to the next one. So yeah, take these principles, but then apply them with a persona and then the next activities. That's how this works. If you don't do that, well, eh, it'll help a little, but it won't actually make a difference for you. All right, maybe Fantastic. one more. That's it for questions at the moment, unless someone quickly typed one in the chat. Otherwise- um, you got 12 seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, Corey's got one, okay. No, oh yeah, Corey has one more. Uh, and we have one from Ankit here. In your opinion, Ben, what are the key things that make a post or a story stand out from others? And how can I learn that, especially for creating awareness about a story? I'm going to cover that in the third session a little bit. Um, probably the, the main thing is if you understand your first follower, like what, what actually matters to them, and you're telling them that in your message, in your comms, in your, um, in your posts and things like that, then that's, that's going to do it. Um, the question is like, what is that for your cause? And the answer to that is only going to be found with some experimentation. Um, but once we've got the persona and the funnel, which is what we'll talk about tomorrow, we'll have a bit of a under better understanding of where to start with that experimentation so that we can find the thing quicker, the thing to say quicker. Uh, so for the personas, do you recommend it being someone who would use the nonprofit service or someone who could donate to the nonprofit or a combo of both? Again, it depends on the cause. Um, some causes I've worked with, the people you've supported have also been donors, either in the future um, or, uh, you know, while they're receiving support. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. Uh, typically, um, 
typically it's generally, you know, if you're supporting a person um, and they're accessing the service, they're, they're most likely a bit too vulnerable to provide funding and to pay, pay for the support at the same time. And obviously there's some ethical connotations too, because you don't want people to feel like they have to donate in order to get the support. Ideally, it should be like, I get the support and that's that. I don't have to worry about it because whatever I'm going through is it's too big a deal to have to worry about that. Does that kind of make sense? So usually I target a non-recipient. Yep, lots of links coming through. Um, we've got so many links for you and a workbook and things like that. And I'll try and throw in some more resources and the Canva not-for-profit community. I'll try and jump on there in a little bit too. All right, I think that's it. Thanks everyone. Fantastic. Uh, Look forward to seeing luck. you tomorrow. Please do the homework. <laughs> I feel like a teacher. <laughs>